billions of years ago, before mankind ever existed on the earth, the universe was ruled by a race of powerful, malevolent creatures of evil and horror beyond human comprehension. They reigned supreme throughout the universe for countless eons, torturing and subjugating all other races that feared them, until the wise ones came from beyond the furthest stars to engage them in battle. The wise ones, beings of light and wisdom and reason, the war between the Dark Ones and the Wise Ones lasted for many millennia. But at last, the Wise Ones were victorious. The defeated Dark Ones were banished to a realm of darkness. And then the Wise Ones sealed the portal, ascending back to their world beyond the stars. I know all this because I was a research scientist stationed at a remote outpost in the barren frozen wastes of Antarctica. Part of an archaeological expedition assigned by a university, I won't say which, to study the natural history of that vast and desolate ice continent. Eight months ago, my team made an astounding discovery in the heart of the Transantarctic Mountains. The ruins of what we had at first believed to be that of an ancient civilization, older than any previously known to have existed. Over the next few months, our research revealed that the ruins were not of human construct. Analysis of soil and mineral samples taken from the buildings during our preliminary investigation revealed something beyond belief. They were at least half a billion years old, from the Paleozoic era at the latest. To put it in perspective, the earliest progenitors of the human race are believed to only be around 6 million years old. Modern humans as we know them have only existed for around 200,000 years. And the earliest known civilization is only around 6,000 years old. To say we were amazed would be an understatement. We had found the remains of a prehistoric, pre-human civilization that had been here long before we had. Long before the earliest organism had emerged from the ocean to evolve into the primates that were our distant ancestors even. We had not made just scientific history, but all forms of history proof that a different species had once existed and had dominated the world before we had. We were ecstatic, convinced we had made the most earth-shattering find of all time, one that was going to radically change what we thought of the distant past of our planet. We were going to be famous. We revealed our find to the president of the university back home, and he told us to keep quiet and not to reveal one word to the public until we had collected more data. His concern was understandable, given the massive impact this was going to have on civilization when the news finally broke. We postulated that in the distant past, when what was now Antarctica had still been part of the supercontinent Gondwana, the region had been much warmer and inhabitable. Then, when Antarctica broke away, roughly 180 million years ago, and the continent began to freeze, its inhabitants had died off, leaving the ruins of their civilization behind. We continued our investigation of the ruins. Then, just over four months ago, on our last expedition to the site, we had made another significant find. The mostly buried entrance to an underground structure. We cleared away the debris and six of us entered. Our flashlights and headlamps revealed that we were at the top of an enormous subterranean chamber that resembled a silo with a narrow stone stairway that spiraled down to the bottom. Even more incredible, the walls were covered with inscriptions. We studied them carefully as we cautiously descended to the bottom of the chamber. The inscriptions were a strange cross between ancient pictographs and Egyptian hieroglyphics. Bizarre symbols none of us could comprehend the meaning of, interspersed with drawings. Drawings that we found somewhat disturbing. Strange looking creatures. Some that resembled a cross between octopuses and dinosaurs. They were enormous, with scaly bodies and claws, but also tentacles. Some that looked like a cross between spiders and scorpions, with many multi-jointed limbs and huge stingers protruding above their rears. Some that didn't look like anything I could even compare them to. They were beyond description. And they all had red eyes and huge mouths lined with giant fangs multiple mouths all over their bodies. 
Rankin, the linguistics and cryptology expert of the team, immediately set about documenting the inscriptions, recording them with the camera he brought along. Meanwhile, we continued our descent. The structure was much taller than we had first guessed. The stairs just kept going down into the darkness. Then, we became aware of something. The illumination. A barely perceptible sense of light coming from down below. The further down we went, the brighter it got. Soon, we no longer needed our flashlights. When we finally reached the bottom, I estimate we were about 400 feet below the surface. We just stopped and stood there staring around, transfixed in awe. We were speechless. The bottom of the circular chamber was about 50 yards in diameter. It was lit with a soft yellow glow. Eight devices stood against the wall, positioned to form a circle. Devices. Technological constructions. They were rectangular and standing upright, resembling refrigerators, about eight feet tall, three feet wide. They were made out of a highly polished silver metal. In the source of the glow were the narrow beams from a radiant yellow light. Like laser beams, they were emanating from two of the devices, which I will refer to as units, were humming at a low and steady rate, still functioning. The other six units were silent and appeared to be dead. Incredulous, we turned our attention to what lay in the exact center of the room, which the two functioning horizontal light beams were focused upon. Looking at it, I felt a sudden, irrational feeling of overwhelming terror and hopelessness. It resembled a ball of blackness, suspended in the air about three feet above the ground. It was probably about six feet in diameter. The blackness was moving. It shimmered and rippled and undulated constantly, looking like oily dark water. The blackness was unnatural. It was the antithesis of not just light, but existence itself. Blackness that was blacker than the heart of every murderer and sadist that ever lived. It was evil. That's the only way I can describe it. Looking at it, I felt like it was sentient and looking right back at me, into the core of my soul, threatening to devour me and corrupt every good dream and feeling of love and joy and peace I had ever experienced. It wanted to consume the better nature of my being until there was nothing left but blackness, like itself. It terrified me in a way I couldn't even describe to myself. I only glanced at it for a few seconds, unable to bear any more. My colleagues must have experienced the same thing because they also quickly averted their eyes and pointedly faced away from the dark mass. We began to examine the units against the walls. Jennings tried to touch one of the two active ones, but his hand was repelled by an invisible force. There was some kind of barrier, force field around the two units, protecting them. Feldman, our tech expert and engineer, began to inspect one of the six units that we surmised had broken down. None of these still had working force fields. He told us it didn't appear to be mounted or fixed in place, and suggested we try removing it and hauling it back to the surface so we could examine it more thoroughly at camp. But when we tried, we found that even with the six of us pulling our combined weight, we could not so much as budge the oblong bulk a single inch. It must have weighed at least a ton or more. By then, it was getting dark and the already frigid and arctic temperature was rapidly dropping. With some reluctance, we assented to return to the surface and return the next day for a more in-depth investigation. We all carried a crazy kind of excitement. This changed things drastically. We had discovered an ancient, yet apparently highly advanced technology that had belonged to a long-vanished non-human race. A technology that was still operational after God only knows how many millions of years. These beings hadn't been a primitive society. They had possessed a highly sophisticated science that was far beyond our own. 
on the walk back to the top of the structure, to the temporary camp we had set up outside. We speculated widely on our discovery and what it could possibly be. Feldman was of the opinion that it might be some sort of power generator or reactor with the undulating black mass acting as its core. This opened all kinds of possibilities. Not just for us, but the future of mankind. If we could dismantle one of the defunct units, it would be possible to study it. Perhaps reverse engineer its design. A technology that would generate a power source that could last for millions of years. I had trouble falling to sleep in my tent that night. So great was my excitement. Over the next few weeks, we returned to the underground chamber every day to collect more data. Rand can continue to document the inscriptions etched into the stone circumference of the structure, while we assisted Feldman in the study of the dead units. All of us ignoring that mysterious black ball that was hanging in the air in the middle of the chamber. That dark, shimmering mass that filled us with such irrational dread whenever we glimpsed it. During the second week, something happened. We noticed that one of the two working light beams, for lack of a better term, had grown substantially weaker and slimmer than its counterpart. While the other beam had maintained its solidness and diameter, which we measured to be exactly 38 millimeters, about that of a silver dollar, this one was now about 24 millimeters, about the diameter of a quarter, and no longer shone with the same strong luminous quality we had observed when we had first entered the space. Also, we noted the unit that evidently produced the beam was no longer generating a smooth, steady low hum, but had begun to produce a discordant rumbling, not unlike the sound of an automotive engine badly in need of maintenance. It was unmistakably the sound of machinery beginning to fail. Over the next few days, the faltering beam grew increasingly dim and weak, until it was no thicker than a strand of hair. Its once bright glow now reduced to an infinitesimal and nearly indiscernible yellow flicker like the filament of a dying light bulb. One night, about five days after we had learned the light beam was failing, we were all awakened by a most unusual phenomenon. The ground was shaking beneath us, with a low threatening rumble. It… it was an earthquake, a not unheard of but still remarkably rare occurrence in Antarctica, rare enough to garner our surprise and concern. We grouped up outside our tents in the sub-zero darkness, each of us looking at the other in wide-eyed alarm. After about ten minutes, the shaking stopped and the ground was still. We returned to our tents, all worried that perhaps the quake had potentially damaged the structure, or perhaps obstructed in some way to prevent us from continuing our research. To our immense relief, when we returned the next day, we discovered the chamber was apparently unharmed by the upheaval of the night before. Duval was the first to notice that the failing beam had finally winked out, and its unit had finally fallen silent. Robertson commented that perhaps the earthquake had finished the job of stealing the faltering machinery. We resumed our inspection of the chamber and the units. After three weeks of much probing and tinkering, Feldman finally discovered a means to disassemble one of the dead units. With our assistance, he was able to remove the outer frame of the device and display its internal components. What he saw left him baffled. He studied the complex looking constituents that lay therein in much depth and told us at length he couldn't make any heads or tails of what he was seeing. He suggested he dismantle the components of the unit and take them back with us so he could study them in the much better equipped facilities of the laboratory back at the main installation, which would be far more suitable for his purpose. We agreed. It had been nearly a month by then, and we had pretty well collected all the data we could at that point. Rankin had finished documenting the etchings, and our supplies were running low. We universally agreed. It was time to return to the outpost. I called our pilot Nash on the radio unit we had brought with us, and we waited up top with our gear for the helicopter to arrive. We finally heard the unmistakable sound of its approach. 
Nash ferried the six of us back to the compound, and the rest of the team greeted us with a hero's welcome, listening enthralled as we recounted our latest discovery. Feldman showed them the disassembled components he had brought back with us. Their reaction was one of disbelief. By then, the Antarctic winter was setting in, and the sunlight was steadily diminishing daily. We decided that further exploration of the ruins would not be safely feasible until the following spring. It didn't really matter. We had already collected a wealth of data, enough to keep us all occupied until then. We decided to bunker down in our outpost and begin analyzing our finds. Feldman set about studying the strange apparatus we had recovered from the chamber, and Rankin began the arduous task of transcribing to all etchings and painstakingly attempting to decipher their meaning with the aid of his computer. The next two months passed without incident. We went about our tedious, routine daily tasks, fighting the growing sense of isolation and boredom that comes with being confined in an Antarctic shelter for months on end as the polar winter raged outside. The only thing I noticed that struck me as peculiar was Rankin's seemingly abrupt change in mood about a month after we had returned to the base. His usual affable, outgoing demeanor shifted suddenly, and he became sullen and withdrawn, keeping mostly to himself during our leisure time and not joining us in our normal recreational activities. He seldom spoke, and when pressed to do so, his answers were short and absent-minded, as if his mind was preoccupied with something else. He began to lose weight and grew pale and disheveled, and the rest of us began to fear for his well-being. We wondered if he was spending too much time poring over his inscriptions and computer, and were concerned that he was so engrossed in his endeavor that he was exhausting himself both mentally and physically. Carlisle suggested that perhaps it was cabin fever setting in. Regardless, we all agreed we needed to keep an eye on him in case his condition worsened. Then, a month ago, the horror began. That afternoon, Feldman summoned the whole team to his lab. He was utterly confounded. He admitted to us that after weeks of attempting to analyze the components of the cryptic device, he had been unsuccessful in his endeavor to understand how the unit worked or even what purpose its individual parts served. It went completely over his head. A technology so intricate and radically advanced, it baffled the mind. All he could determine was that the material it was constructed from was unlike steel or any metallic alloy he could identify. He suggested that, after we return to civilization, we should send the unit to better outfit the scientific institutes where perhaps someone else would have more luck in breaking its enigma. But we were all dubious that it would stand any better a chance that he had. Feldman was one of the most skilled and insightful technical engineers I had met in the course of my career. I spotted Rankin standing near the back of the room as Feldman finished speaking. I was greatly alarmed by what I saw. His eyes were white and seemed to express a look of hopeless doom and despair. His face was tense with consternation. His hands kept snapping compulsively into fists. Troubled, I filed out of the lab with the others, resolved that tomorrow I would confront Rankin and query him on the source of his distress. I never got the chance. That night, I was awakened in my quarters by a sound that sent horror coursing through my veins into my heart like a shot of adrenaline. A distant scream, high and wavering, a sound of pure animalistic agony and terror that slowly faded to a weak groan. Jumping up, I frantically rifled through the contents of my dresser until I found the pistol I kept there. Leaving my quarters, I cautiously made my way down the hall to where the scream had originated from. As I passed the quarters of my compatriots, I beheld a bloodbath. Their doors all stood open, and each room had been transformed into an abattoir. My teammates appeared to have all been slaughtered in their sleep. Their corpses sprawled across their beds in gruesome repose. Slater, Jennings, Whitman, Duval, Feldman, and all the others. I arrived at the end of the hall and stepped into the large recreational room in the center of the installation. There, I beheld a grisly sight. 
Nash, the helicopter pilot, was crawling across the floor, leaving a trail of blood, his intestines dragging behind him. Rankin, his eyes wild, a frenzied look of pure insanity on his face, was following after him with a fire axe, both it and he splattered with fresh blood. I stood there, transfixed in shock at this macabre tableau, distantly realizing that Nash's quarters were chasing to my own at the end of the corridor. The madman Jenkins had been methodically slipping into our rooms one by one as he made his way down the hall, butchering us as we slumbered, defenseless and unaware of the danger. Something must have alerted Nash, and he tried to escape. If not for his scream to warn me of the threat, I would surely have been next. Nash noticed me standing in the recreation room doorway like a statue and began crawling in my direction, reaching his bloody hand up to me in supplication, a desperate, pleading expression on his pained features. Behind him, the lunatic Rankin hoisted the axe eye, his teeth bared in a rictus of concentration, and swung down into the prone figure's skull. There was a sickening crunch of bone and blood, and brain matter splattered the wall. Rankin looked up, seeing me, and began to wrench the axe free from Nash's skull. Snapping out of my stupor, I remembered the pistol in my head and raised it quickly, firing instinctively. The shot took Rankin in his chest, and he stumbled back, dropping the axe and collapsing to the floor, groaning. I approached him slowly, keeping a cautious distance. The gun still aimed on him. I found my voice and stammered out. Why? He looked at me. Insanity and reason seemed to return to his eyes, even as his life was rapidly fading from his body. He was shot through the heart and dying quickly. His voice was weak but calm. I... I was... doing them a favor. It's better this way. Better for all of us all of humanity to die before they they come back I stared at him dumbly they I I translated the inscriptions almost two months ago I know what they mean it's more awful than you can imagine he looked at me with a beseeching expression Please, Travis, read, read my notebooks, you'll understand, and then, then you'll wish you had let me kill you. He groaned, and his head fell back. He was dead, stunned in shock by what had just transpired. I let the pistol fall from my grip and staggered out of the room, distantly realizing that I was all alone in the station, the rest of my team all dead. The only sound was the gale force and arctic winds howling around the compound outside. I started for the emergency radio, intending to contact the authorities at McMurdo station and notify them of the situation to request for help. But I stopped before I reached it, hesitating. I changed my course and headed back down the hallway to the sleeping quarters. I went to Rankin's room and entered. It was a shambles. The bed sheets were in disarray and stink. It didn't smell as if Rankin had changed him or paid attention to his personal hygiene in weeks. Trash littered the floor and the walls were covered with nightmarish drawings done by Rankin's own hand. Hideous, bestial abominations that bore a distinct resemblance to those I'd seen etched on the wall of the underground chamber. I saw three composition notebooks atop Rankin's cluttered desk. I sat in his chair, opened the topmost one, and began reading his handwriting. I read for over three hours. I slumped back putting my face in my hands and fighting to contain a wail of soul-rending terror and anguish that threatened to rise up from deep within my throat. Rankin was right. 
I did understand. I understood everything. And it was much worse than anything I could have conjured in my worst nightmares. I read of the dark ones and the wise ones. They were war, the dark ones, eventual defeat, and subsequent exile to the realm of darkness. The portal the wise ones had sealed before leaving our universe for the world beyond the stars. The portal had been sealed with eight force barriers. The portal that my team and I stumbled upon here on our own planet. The etchings had been left as a warning to anyone who should find the chamber. Which had been a sort of prison. The dark, shimmering mass of blackness was akin to a cell and the eight energy beams had acted like bars sealing that cell. The wise ones had been beings of incredible wisdom and science, but they hadn't been gods or immortals. They had merely been a highly advanced race eons more evolved than ours. And the force beams that sealed the portal, that unholy, godless black mass in the center of the chamber, were not magic. They had unbelievable longevity, Enough to sustain them for untold millions, if not billions of years. But they had still been mere mortal technology, alien technology that was eons more developed than our own. A technology so advanced that even our past scientific minds have no way to replicate or repair it, let alone understand it. Once, there had been eight barriers, but over the ages, the centuries and millennia that had passed beyond number, they had weakened and degraded, as all technology must, until only one beam, one bar if you will, remained to hold the cell shut. The cell that was a doorway from the realm of darkness to our world. Perhaps the wise ones were aware that those beams were only a temporary means of containing the dark ones and intended to return to our world to replace or repair them when the time came. But that was hundreds of millions of years ago and sharing the inevitable fate of all mortal species. Their race is doubtlessly long since extinct. I have no way of knowing how long that last energy barrier will remain to seal the portal. It could hold for another hundred years, or another thousand. But from the perspective of existence, our time has grown short. Eventually, it will break like the others and the portal will reopen, and then they will return, the original rulers of the universe, to reclaim the world that was once theirs, and there is nothing we can do about it, nothing that can save us, nowhere we can escape. I radioed for help, telling them Rankin had gone berserk apparently due to claustrophobia owing to our long confinement at the base. After about two weeks, an emergency evac helicopter arrived to take me back home. I returned to the States and resigned from my position at the university. I told the president that the earthquake had sealed the chamber and that all of our data had been destroyed by Rankin during his grace rampage. I didn't tell anyone else about our discovery in the Antarctic. The ruins, or the chamber, or the portal, or Rankin's notebooks. Who would believe me? And what good would it do to warn them, even if they did believe me? There is nothing any of us can do. Still, I feel I must share this tale with someone, anyone who will listen to it. I decided to post this on a forum for others like me with stories that most will find hard to believe if not outright insane or ridiculous. I write this, not as a warning, but merely as a plea to embrace however much time we have left to make the most of life while we can. I watch the news religiously, fearing that any day I would hear of an earthquake in the Antarctic Circle an earthquake that will signify that at last the light beam has gone out. Time is running out. See. Or.
Coming back.